Hub Sessions. I'm delighted to welcome Susanna Howard from SNE Integrated Care System. She's going to explain a bit more about who she is and what she's here to tell you. Uh, Susanna is going to tell us a story and present some slides. We will be recording so that we can share it with others who couldn't attend today, if that's OK. Aaron Townsend, Alexa Fox. Uh, you're on audio, <laughs> somebody. Um, and we will have a Q&A session for Susanna at the end where you can raise your hand and or use the chat. Um, Viv and I will do our best to help Susanna field all those questions if they come flooding in simultaneously. If you think of a question as Susanna's going along, by all means put it in the chat, but then you're reliant on a blind person to read it back to Susanna later when we're trying to coordinate it. So, you know, take your pick. Um, other than that, with no further ado, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy 2024. First LGE event of any nature in 2024, I believe. Viv's recording. Over to Susanna. OK, thank you very much, Kate. So I'm going to share screens and so hopefully everyone can now see um, a slide with some pictures of some of my colleagues in Christmas jumpers. Um, uh, I know it's after Christmas, um, but um, uh, what I'm going to do uh, this lunchtime is is take a little bit of a journey um, and I'm going to talk about our integrated care system up in Suffolk and North East Essex but I'm going to do it in a rather different way to maybe the way that you're used to hearing about these sorts of things so just as a bit of introduction um, I've been involved with the ICS since pretty much the beginning and um, uh, when kind of this was a, a kind of glimmer in the eye of um, the, the government somewhere and um, my background is actually originally as a psychologist. Um, if you've read anything about my background, I've worked in uh, particularly um, uh, in the UK, but also overseas and in trauma affected areas. So I'm not sure if that qualifies me to work in the area of collaboration. Uh, you can tell me um, uh, um, maybe a little bit later if you think that's true. So I'm going to be talking about, because I'm a psychologist, behaviours, culture, relationships, that's all my bag. And I'm going to take a little bit of journey through our ICS from that perspective. Um, and it'd be interesting to see if any of this resonates with any of you. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start with a kind of question about why it is that we need to be good at collaborating. And I always start this with this picture of my mum. So this is my mum and she's, she's currently a resident in a care home in North East Essex. But back seven or so years ago, when I very first took on the role to be the kind of programme director to bring together an ICS in, in Suffolk and North East Essex, I went to go and see my mum. Now, my mum's a difficult lady to impress. And I said to mum, I said, look, I'm going to be doing this new job, mum. I said, I'm going to be working with everybody involved with health and care locally in Suffolk and North East Essex. I said, so that they all work together. And she just looked at me and she said, well, don't they do that anyway? And that was probably the best question that anybody's ever asked me about collaboration in, in the health and care sector. So we went on and I tried to kind of explain a bit more and I tried to explain a little bit about why we needed to have an ICS. And, and the way I found to doing that was to talk about her experiences, about um, her frustration and her endless despair with me as her daughter, about lots of things, obviously, but, but her endless despair that she would, would say to me when we were trying to battle through her two uh, knee replacements, a hip replacement, shoulder replacements, pacemaker, you name it, she's had it all done. Um, she'd say to me, well, don't you work in the health and care system? Shouldn't you know how to how this works? So, you know, we kind of know this, don't we? We know that um, when we're ourselves trying to find our way through the health and care system, it's often um, feels much more difficult than it should do. So um, you're going to find me talking about Google a lot this lunchtime. Um, but if you kind of care to go on Google and you go, OK, so can somebody explain to me how it works? The health and care system in England at a glance, you'll find helpful, simple diagrams like this one. There you go. That sums it all up in a one. -er. And we know we know that, you know, the way that our system, our health and care system has worked up until now has been inordinarily complicated. And it's made stories like this one really familiar. And this is a story about four people called anybody, everybody, somebody and nobody. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it and nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realised that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. And I, I've always really liked that little um, poem because for me, it kind of sums up the kind of 
confusion that we often kind of get ourselves into when we're trying to work out how we work together. So, you know, we've had decades, haven't we, of kind of lots of different attempts to kind of try and fix kind of health and care and so on. And most of those, I think I'd sum up by saying they've been kind of mechanistic. They felt a little bit like we've been, you know, certainly for me, for my career, I feel like I've had, you know, lots of experience of trying to kind of put my head under the bonnet of the health and care sector and trying to kind of connect up bits of the engine so that it kind of tunes up perfectly and delivers what it is that we need. But I think at the same time, and if you, like me, have, have, have been tinkering under the bonnet wherever you are, you've probably also woken up at two o'clock in the morning feeling a little bit like this, that kind of whilst we're trying to kind of fix the problem, the the the, the kind of um, tides are rising. This isn't a picture of uh, Suffolk during the recent floods, but, you know, it, you know, we know that a lot of the issues are kind of um, becoming um, very, very significant. So integrated care systems are um, uh, uh, the English um, attempt at trying to address those issues. And we know that, you know, back in 2022, now we moved to having 42 statutory official integrated care systems. And I always say you can make integrated care systems as complicated or as simple as you want. The simple way to understand them is it's about bringing together everyone, and it really should be everyone in health and care who serve the population. So for us in Suffolk and North East Essex, um, it's a population of just over a million people. And by everyone, we mean the whole roll call, you know, NHS commissioners and NHS trusts, absolutely, but also county councils, both social care and public health. Our district and borough councils have a really key role around health and wellbeing for local communities. GPs, dentists, pharmacists, optometrists, our voluntary community, faith and social enterprise sector, social care, residential and domiciliary providers, public and patient representatives, you know, all of these stakeholders are absolutely key. Um, to the way that we work. And when you look at Suffolk and North East Essex and so our patch, if you like, and you start to kind of look at the breadth of different partners, that means you very quickly could fill up a slide about 10 times bigger than the one I've put on the screen with all these logos, because actually you're talking about many thousands of different stakeholders. And if that looks complicated to us, then we know that it looks really complicated when you're somebody trying to navigate the system. So this is a picture that was shared with me by Healthwatch Essex with the permission of the lady who's photographed in the middle, Sam Fox. And she just mapped out, if you like, all of the different touch points she had with the health and care sector. And you can see how many of them there are. They were in lots of different contexts as well, in terms of her being a patient in primary care and secondary care, um, her contacts with the voluntary sector, community sector and other parts of the system as well. So we know that what people want, what people, communities, and actually indeed our staff want, is a local health and care system that's genuinely can do. When, when we go to see if it's wherever we come into contact with people um, around our health and care sector, we want somebody to be can do, don't we? We want somebody who, to say, look, you know, I can help you find your way through the system. I can help you find the solution that you're seeking. And yet far too often, if you like, you know, it feels more complicated than that. We want, you know, for most of us, we've been on this never ending kind of journey to try and put people at the centre of what we do. So I'm going to move on to the second question, which is about. So how do you organise a collaboration between so many different partners? And um, I, I recently was at an event and um, a colleague from Essex County Council made a really good comment and said, you know, what was it? To every question, there's usually a simple answer and it's wrong. And I have to say, for me, the really exciting thing about integrated care systems is it gives us an opportunity to actually meet the complexity that we've got in health and care and, and the way that people's health and well-being interacts with their lives and the, the, their local kind of communities with, with something which is much more sophisticated than what we've seen before. So I've been involved in the ICS um, for a long time and I know some people on the call um, who I've been in contact over that time. And one of the most common questions that I'll get asked is people will say to me, OK, Susanna, can you explain it to me? Can you explain to me the Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care System? Can you send me your system structure chart? So I say, yep, yeah, absolutely. I'll send it through to you. Here it is. This is our system structure chart. The truth is that our system has thousands of different stakeholders within it who interact in a myriad of different complex ways. And it's the relationships between all those people that really makes the difference. And that's why I want to talk about relationships this morning. Now, unfortunately, what you tend to find is that when people see that amount of complexity, 
there's a real temptation to try and manage it and to try and say, OK, look, it's really, really complex. It's really diverse. Let's try and make it simple. So at the beginning of our ICS, I certainly attended lots of meetings that looked a bit like this. You know, you get people in the room, somebody would try and draw a kind of structure or a high, and it would, you know, invariably be hierarchical and it would be about how this bit of the system is going to relate to that system. And I've got one bit of advice to you if you ever get invited to a meeting like that, which is I just refuse, leave, just don't engage because I've never seen it end well. And the reason that I've never seen that end well is that I genuinely don't believe that hierarchies are for systems. I think systems offer us a different opportunity and a different way of thinking. So we need to think about what we know about systems. So if you think about ecosystems, they're complex, they're diverse, they're what we're trying to talk about. And on, on if you look up the dictionary definition of ecosystems, I like the, the definition on, at the bottom of the page here. It says any complicated system consisting of many different people, processes and activities. And it talks about the way that they affect each other. And that for me sums up the life that we've got in terms of the way that we work, particularly in public service, and the way that we need to work in a complex integrated system. So in Suffolk and North East Essex, and I'm going to move on, you know, we've got lots of features of our, our integrated care system. Yes, we've got a new NHS commissioning body, our, our integrated care board. We've got our integrated care partnership. We work very closely with our two health and wellbeing boards in Essex and in Suffolk. And then we've got place-based alliances. We've got NHS provider collaboratives, a voluntary sector assembly, a chairs group. We've got integrated neighbourhood teams, primary care networks, and probably lots of other arrangements that I couldn't get on this slide. And the point is, is that these are all just places and ways in which people come together and work together within that broader system. So one of the questions that I get asked as well is that, well, you know, is this just a passing fad? You know, is this something that we're doing at the moment in England and we're going to move forward and it will be something else soon? Because that's kind of been the case, hasn't it, for a long time that, you know, we've seen a lot of change in terms of the way we address things. I was in a hotel in London a couple of years ago before the pandemic and I, I spotted a newspaper sitting on the coffee table as I was, and my husband was checking out the reception and it was a copy of, a copy of China Daily newspaper. It was a Chinese national newspaper. And on the front page was this article. The headline was Integrated Elderly Care Network is Key to Future. And the article talked about the fact that China has an aging population. People's health and care needs are becoming ever more complex. And actually, the, the sheer scale and diversity of different stakeholders that needed to come together and work together to support people was becoming ever more diverse as well. And it talked about the fact that what they really needed to do was to actually find a way to achieve that integration in that network. And indeed, anywhere you look on the planet, you will find that pretty much every single country has an agenda around integration in health and care. So integration and the management of effective systems is the key challenge for our planet in the 21st century. And actually, it's not even just confined to health and care. System working is the 21st century challenge, I would argue. And this is a picture of Atul Gawande, who, for those who are fans of the BBC Reith Lectures, he did a fantastic series of BBC Reith Lectures. He's done some great TED Talks as well. He's a Harvard surgeon. He talks about simple ideas for treating a painfully complex system. And he talks about integration in healthcare as being the most ambitious thing that humans have ever attempted. So why is that? Why is, is integration so difficult? And what makes collaboration so difficult? Because you know, it sounds great in theory, but I think the reality is sometimes a little bit different. Now, the first idea I want to put across to you is that what we're asking people to do, we're all human beings, is we're asking them to do something that's actually very, very difficult. And that is to collaborate. So if you if you get your iPhone and you type in the word collaboration and you look up a definition of collaboration, um, you'll find that there are two um, uh, description. So the first one is the one that most of us sign up to. It sounds great. The action of working with someone to produce something. Yeah, something produced in collaboration with someone. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? We're all going to get together. We're going to sit in a circle, hold hands, sing and by R. It's going to be marvellous. If you remember nothing else from what I say today at lunchtime, just remember this. There's always a second definition of collaboration, and it's this. Traitorous cooperation with an enemy. Because, you know, we need to be clear that when we come together and we bring partners together, different partners inevitably have different perspectives. So we know these are two great quotes about, 
you know, perspective, you know, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you're standing and where you stand depends on where you sit. That's a quote from Nelson Mandela. So the whole point is in collaboration is to bring people together who have different perspectives and those different perspectives, if you like, inevitably will lead to some friction. They will lead to some tensions. Another dimension to integrated care systems, I think it's one that's really, really important to all of us at the moment as, you know, leaders in public sector um, now in 2024 is increasingly how much we need to balance conflicting values. So a great book um, that you might want to have a look at sometime is by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms, and they talked about old power and new power. So they talked about the fact that, you know, the kind of 20th century and a lot of the kind of values that underpinned a lot of the kind of institutions that developed during that time was old world power values. They were about formal governance, managerialism, institutionalism, competition, resource consolidation, separating private and public spheres. They're about specialisation, expertise, professionalism. And that's very different to the kind of new power values that really now collaboration and system working is about. Because though, you know, those come around to you know values like informal governance, opt-in decision making, self-organization, collaboration, you know, open sourcing, radical transparency, a do-it-ourselves ethic, you know, and more overall participation. So, you know, within us, we can even have this internal conflict that on the one hand, we have responsibilities and often as leaders to, you know, old power values and old power responsibilities, but actually we are trying to work in a new power way as well. We can see the value of both things. And then we can also be conflicted internally about kind of this issue about silos. So everybody loves to, to diss a silo, don't they? They talk about, oh, silos are terrible. We should get out of our silo. They're terrible. You know, they resist change. They're incestuous. They hoard talent. They hoard resources. They self-protect. You know, they focus on individual good. But just to kind of leave silos a little bit of love for a minute, you know, actually being able to contain some work within a particular team as a way to harness expertise, hit goals quickly, they're easier to manage, create belonging, provide focus. So sometimes, you know, that tension about the extent to which we need to be inside and outside our teams and organisations can be a really kind of key one as well to recognise. So all of that tends to come together when we bring multiple leaders to work together in rooms. Now, I have done my 10,000 hours of meetings with very senior leaders in health and care. I've been in more of them than I care to mention. And I kind of thought, that when I got to this stage in my career and when I was a real grown up, that I'd be able to go to meetings and we'd all be able to do this really, really well. That, you know, when we get to be really kind of important people, that we'd be able to kind of, you know, move smoothly through the day and everything would work really, really perfectly. But I don't think it's that. And I think if we ever needed a reminder that meetings involving multiple leaders don't automatically go well, cast your mind back to this picture of, of multiple leaders trying to agree something, you know, and I, I've seen this. I've seen exactly this. I've, I've, you know, sat through awkward meeting bingo. I've heard the 50 reasons not to change. We know that quite often in those forums, things um, are very different, difficult. So what's the solution? So the solution and, you know, it's really the focus what I want to talk about is, you know, what everyone tells you, it's all about relationships. So we sit and we go, well, relationships, you know, so how are we supposed to know how that works? Well, we're human beings. We are human beings. And so actually we all should know something about how relationships work because they're fundamental to our lives. So back on Google for a minute. And we know that there's great advice out there like this, you know, a successful relationship consists of two things, finding out the similarities, respecting differences. You know, successful relationships have the three C's, communication, compromise and commitment. Love, trust, respect, loyalty and communication, five essential parts of relationships, how to keep a relationship. Um, and then I like this one. Let's keep it simple. Respect my time, match my effort, keep your word, always be honest and stay consistent. And, you know, there's lots, you know, we know lots as, as just individual human beings about, you know, relationships and what's important in terms of maintaining relationships. And I think we don't bring enough of that into um, you know, our workplace quite often. Another great bit of advice about relationships is this, that we know that happily ever after is not a fairy tale, it's a choice. You have to work at relationships, you have to put the work in. So we can make a choice. So one of the choices I want to suggest is that we can choose whether or not to invest in relationships. So if it's important that we collaborate, you know, 
to what extent do we invest in our relationships with people who we need to work together with in other organisations? So I love this quote about the fact that a discussion becomes destructive when it begins to generate more heat than light. And just going back to that issue that there will be inevitable tension in lots of system meetings, I think the real challenge for us as leaders is to hold both things. Absolutely, we have a responsibility to point out where the heat is and where the rub is, but actually, you know, I've seen some extraordinary examples of where colleagues have shown real leadership by bringing light conversations and finding a way forward at the same time, but not letting go of where the issues are and where we need to um, recognise um, barriers and overcome them. Another choice we can make, we can choose not to sabotage our collaboration, whether we do it consciously or subconsciously. So the best possible guidance I can give you on, on sabotage is this. This is the CIA's. If you've never seen this, it's definitely worth looking up on. Uh, just Google it. Um, CIA's um, field guide to um, uh, sabotage. This was actually a real document that was produced during the war for kind of undercover agents who were in organisations. And it gave some really hilarious descriptions for you know, how you could literally undermine any organisation. And I've pulled out this quote from it. So one of the bits of advice it gave you that if you were inside an organisation and you wanted to sabotage its efforts and make sure it failed, because it says to lower morale and production, think of the worst boss you've had and act like that. Be pleasant to inefficient workers, give them undeserved promotions, discriminate against efficient workers, complain unjustly about their work, when possible refer all matters to committees for further study and consideration, attempt to make the committees as large and bureaucratic as possible. And I think, you know, we all know, we laugh at that, don't we? We smile when we see that because we recognise that we know that's how it's done. But we need to make sure that we don't inadvertently sabotage, if you like, efforts to collaborate by doing just those things. Another choice we can make is that we can choose to work on how we transact with others. So some of you might have heard of transactional analysis and another great book, but this is quite an old book, by Eric Byrne was this book here about the psychology of human relationships, games, people play. And in transaction analysis, one of the concepts is that as human beings, we can all function from different ego states. So we can all transact as adults. We can be non-judgmental, open-minded, interested, confident, reality-based. And we'd like to think that we constantly in the workplace transact with all others from that perspective. But also, we are all capable of functioning from a kind of ego state, which is sort of parental. It can be the kind of critical parent, you know, judgmental, authoritarian or nurturing parent. They're there, you know, reassuring, supportive. And I've seen the NHS in particular flip flop sometimes in terms of how it transacts with its staff between being quite kind of authoritarian and nurturing. And, ch you know, child, rebellious child, adapted child, free child. You know, we all you know, can do that. And again, I've seen this in meetings. I've seen meetings with colleagues where people have literally sung songs, told jokes. They play. They play like children in terms of the way they're transacting with one another. Now, the reason this is important is that depending on how we transact, if you like, the transaction that we make depends on the response we get from others. So if we transact as an adult, we'd expect to be met with an adult response. But if we transact as a parent, or from parental ego state, it's no surprise that maybe the response we might get from somebody else might be that they feel they need to respond from a kind of child ego state. And uh, the reason I just draw your attention to this is that, you know, we want to have good adult to adult relationships and really good adult to adult transactions, but it is worth reflecting on how we transact between commissioners and providers, between the statutory sector and non-statutory sector, and as competitors with uh, one another as well. And sometimes, you know, when things get really complex and, you know, it's worth looking up some of this stuff, um, you can you can see that 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 the, this is sort of underpinning what's what's going on. Now, somewhere where I've learned an awful lot about transactional analysis and and how that works in particular has been my family. So I'm going to show you a quick couple of pictures of my family. So on the left there, you can see a picture of uh, 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 ten members of my family. That's my me at the back, uh, sort of in the middle-ish. My husband just in front of me, and we're surrounded by uh, well my sister-in-law, but then the rest of them are, believe it or not our children's stepchildren. We've got a large blended family. So the picture on the right is when we got married, we brought together um, uh, three um, seven to nine year old girls. So that's um, Isabel and Isabel and Eleanor there, uh, age seven and seven and nine. 
And so, you know, we spent a lot of time as a family with three children, if you like, you know, kind of competing um, interests and so on. And they taught me everything there was to know about dramas. Because the one thing I can tell you is that if you've got a lot of kids, it's an absolute achievement to work out where you're going to go on holiday and what you're going to do. And the second thing is there's a lot of drama, particularly um, uh, with 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 kind of, you know, lots of kind of kids. So so dramas are kind of regular. And what you tend to find in dramas is that dramas, you know, Cartman described them as always, you know, dramas. You know, if you go back to fairy tales, they tend to have three core roles in any drama to have a drama. You tend to have a victim, a perpetrator or a persecutor, perpetrator, and a rescuer. And, you know, quite often my kids will come in and say, oh, you know, so-and-so has been really horrible to me. Um, so-and-so has done X, Y, and Z. They just cast themselves as a victim, tell me that they were being persecuted or whatever by, by, by one of the other kids usually. And interestingly, either they were trying to pull me in to rescue or actually, the interesting thing about having three children of a similar age is they'd all move around these three roles really, really regularly. So I, I remember seeing lots of examples of this when my kids were young. So the Cartman Triangle, drama triangle, is a kind of social model of the kind of destructive human interaction that can happen when you've got people in conflict. And the different situations determine the position for each actor in the triangle. So, you know, if you've got a persecutor and a victim, you tend to get a rescuer. If you tend to, the minute you set yourself up to rescue a victim, you're basically automatically describing or putting somebody into that role as being a kind of persecutor. And it's interesting because when you watch this, it can happen a bit like a dance with people swapping roles and switching positions in order to get their needs met. And, you know, in actual fact, these things really kind of end. It tends to become a very entrenched position where there's little change. And the reason that I mention this is that if you want to find a drama, look no further than the health and care sector. There's always dramas in the health and care sector. So here's a drama. I remember when our ICS very first started, Colchester Hospital had been in special measures longer, I think, than any other NHS organisation in the country. We'd had a series of of uh, negative CQC reports. And I remember when I very first was working with Nick Hume, who was took over as chief executive there, um, we were looking at and trying to unpick a little bit about what was going on in terms of the culture in the trust. So, you know, a very common thing would be, you know, you tend to find a lot of people who are kind of heroes and enablers kind of in health, but in inadvertently they can cast other people as being helpless or kind of innocent or, you know, actually wrongly push other people into being the bad guy or trying to kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, put, push power. This stuff means that no one takes responsibility. It's time consuming. It causes anger. It's counterproductive and it's very um, expensive. And um, this is something that Nick and I um, have presented on a couple of times in a couple of places. But um, in actual fact, the extraordinary turnaround at Colchester Hospital um, was really when you unpick it about really addressing a lot of that thing. So really making sure that you don't have that persecution that, that creates people in a rescuer role or a victim role, making sure that, you know, people don't feel that, you know, the temptation to middle where they shouldn't do or that they have to rush in, you know, making sure that people don't feel disempowered and as victims and they don't have the power to change things and really taking the drama out of that situation. So it's just a little bit about transaction analysis and how that makes a difference. But I want to move on. So the next thing I want to talk about is the issue about commands. So I talked earlier on about hierarchies and the reason why, um, and I want to talk a bit more about why I believe that we shouldn't have a hierarchy in an integrated care system. Because being in command doesn't mean that you have to be in control. And the story I want to tell you about this is around Hurricane Katrina. So. I'm sure most of you will remember Hurricane Katrina. So almost 20 years ago now, it was August 28th, 2005, and it was in a, um, a, a, an extraordinary um, event in terms of um, uh, the fact that actually it had been forecast and predicted many, many times before. But actually, um, uh, uh, in the end, if you like, um, things didn't go uh, very well. So you remember that despite the fact that this scenario had been planned for, that a major category revive um, hurricane could hit the Gulf Coast of America, um, we saw some terrible things happen. We saw that, you know, people um, literally died before help could get to them. There were um, terrible um, instances. This is a picture from inside a nursing home in New Orleans. There was 
um, uh, you know, people who sat on roofs um, and um, without water, without food and so on, um, waiting um, for rescue that never came. And of course, none of us can forget what happened at the Superdome. Now, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the inevitable happened. In the aftermath, um, there was a lot of anger. People were upset and people went, you know, how did everyone get it so wrong? And was anybody to blame? It reminds me of that poem that I read out at the beginning. But I want to focus on what went right in Hurricane Katrina. And there is an organisation that, it, you know, is has been um, uh, uh, commended for having saved lives and provided really effective support to local communities during and after the Hurricane Katrina disaster. And um, I haven't got the time to do this, but if I had a bit more time, I might ask for hands up and ask if anybody knows who it is. And people normally guess things like, um, is it the Red Cross? Was it FEMA? And the answer is no, it was none of those things. It was actually this organisation. It was Walmart supermarkets. And what Walmart did was as the storm approached, the chief executive, a guy called Lee Scott, provided a kind of guiding edict to his senior staff and he told them to pass it down through his regional and district store managers and it was really really simple he said this he said a lot of you are going to have to make decisions above your level make the best decision you can with the information that's available to you at the time and above all do the right thing that's literally what all of that he said and what happened was multiple local stores did things like distributed water and food and other supplies to residents. Um, they allowed, store managers allowed their stores to be used as shelters. And in Waveland, Mississippi, the assistant manager, who's an absolute hero to me, Jessica Lewis, she ran a bulldozer through her store to collect the basics that weren't water damaged and then piled them up in the parking lot and gave them away to residents. She also broke into the store's locked pharmacy to supply critical drugs to the local hospital. And I think the thing that for me about that is that that very simple permission that Lee Scott gave as chief executive and handed down would have given Jessica something really important. It removed her from being, you know, the likelihood that afterwards she'd be blamed. And blame in particular is incredibly coercive because blame drives shame. And shame is a really, you know, Brenny Brown describes it as a powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. And pretty much everybody on this call probably is involved in the response to, you know, the pandemic recently. And I remember myself, this huge fear that, you know, with this enormous challenge that we had looming at the beginning of 2020, you know, was I good enough? You know, could I do something? This is this is huge. So what happens when shame is removed? Well, another story from Hurricane Katrina that I love is this one. And this is a picture of a young guy called Jabba Gibson. He was actually a convicted criminal. He was a, a drug dealer with, with a whole string of criminal convictions. And days after Hurricane Katrina, he, he stole a school bus. He went up to a line of school buses, jump-started the school bus, and picked up about 70 stranded people and drove 13 hours from New Orleans to Houston. It was the first bus to arrive at the Astrodome. And the biggest question, I think, about Jabba Gibson isn't, I think we all know why Jabba Gibson really just got on and did the right thing and he stole the school bus. The extraordinary thing for me is that why nobody else did. What was holding people back from doing that, the same thing? Why would they, in the face of an extraordinary disaster, not steal the other school buses that were in the same parking lot? So, you know, Jabba Gibson, there was lots talked about him afterwards and he was one of the early heroes, but, you know, he, he basically stepped up and did what the government felt to. He rescued dozens of people from impending disaster. And for me, one of the things about that is that he felt as if um, he wouldn't be blamed. So what I want to just show you really quickly, and this is literally just a couple of minutes, is a very quick little video about blame. <sighs> How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. 
I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, do, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why, why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na 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 thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening we're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. So, so blame is really corrosive. It's really common in terms of what you tend to see, particularly in the health and care sector. And for me, you know, one of the things is that, you know, um, you know, if we want to kind of, you know, um, have leaders who are able to function well in the health and care sector environment, then we need to, to fix the environment they work in. So I'm going to finish off with some things about how we can make collaboration work. And the first thing I want to talk about is that, you know, um, this is another great book. Um, Simon Sinek talked about Start With Why, and he talked about the fact that leaders and organisations, the capacity to inspire, they all tend to think and act and communicate in a similar way from the inside out. He talks about the fact that when we communicate our purpose and our cause first, we communicate in a way that drives decision making and behaviour. And it literally kind of taps into the part of our brain that inspires each other. Now, in his TED Talk, another TED Talk, he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Martin Luther King gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan one. And the reason I want to draw his attention to this is because far too often, despite the fact that what we're trying to do is we're trying to do what's in my cartoon, put people at the centre of the work that we're doing, in actual fact, we don't talk enough about that. We don't talk enough about why we need to work together. What we tend to do is we focus on what it is that we're doing. And as I said, all of that kind of, you know, um, myriad of, of, of different kind of pathways between um, our different kind of services. So we've taken this on board in Suffolk North East Essex. We've, we've started trying to use kind of outcome based approaches outcome-based accountability in terms of what we do. So as an example, you know, is our diabetes program good enough? Well, you know, we seem to be hitting the target. Our, this is an, an old slide, our CCG ratings were outstanding. We've hit all the targets. We're spending lots of money. We're hitting the target. But, you know, if we looked at, well, you know, are less people developing diabetes and is everyone receiving the best care? That's not really the case. So it's quite often, if you like, we can be focusing on the things on the left and hitting the target but still missing the point and you know we've got lots of other examples of this um you know the um uh, right care programs i'm a big big fan of these are 
projects in A&E departments or emergency departments, trying to work in a different way with people who tend to be very frequent attenders. And, you know, it's really important. But, you know, how do you measure the success of that? Because we talk about it being successful because 999 calls are down, A&E attendances are down, admissions are down. But those are successes for the organisation. What we really need to ask is, you know, what, you know, how are the people? How are those 50 people? Are they happy, healthy? Are they reconnected with their families and communities? How's that worked? So I'm not going to talk much about OB. I'm going to talk about the fact that it's about finding common ground. It's about finding a common language and talking on the same page. And we know this is important. This is a this is from the Bible. I can't get through this without a quote from the Bible, the tower, based story of the Tower of Genesis, where you know the Babylonians are trying to build this tower to heaven and God didn't want them to do it. So what he did was he got them to all speak different languages so they couldn't communicate together and work together. And if you doubt the fact that we do this, then just have a look at my ICS jargon generator. So in this, you can basically take any word from the middle and combine it with words from the outside and you'll sound ever so clever in meetings, but no one will know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you can talk about kind of, you know, a, 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 a qualitative outcome or a targeted goal or an incremental result or a systemic objective or whatever it is. And you'll be talking perfect ISIS babble. Um, but actually, we're not talking about the same things. And um, I'm not going to say anything more about um, uh, outcome based working other than have a look at it, because it, it really scared me in terms of the extent to which a lot of the time and effort I was spending was wasted. So lastly, building, how do we make it inclusive? How do we make systems feel like everybody is a part of them? And um, I, I need to admit to pinching this next slide from um, a colleague Jeff Banks, who who worked previously in Mid and South Essex systems, a colleague of mine, that you know he talked about the fact that you know in any integrated care system we've got lots of as I've talked about thousands of different partners, big organisations, small organisations, different shaped organisations. You know, let's face it, the NHS is very different to local government. Our voluntary community sector is necessarily different to the statutory sector and so on. So we've got lots of different organisations, and that's the that's the fantastic thing about it. But I despair sometimes at the extent to which only really a couple of those organisations feel as if we're part of the system. We need to change that. We need to make it feel as if everybody is part of the system and we need to work to doing that. Jeff always talked about the fact that we needed to kind of work to cultivate uh, our integrated care. And I want to go back to the idea about an integrated care ecosystem, because, you know, we know that, you know, as much as we'd love to think that every part of you know, um, uh, our landscape would be filled with diverse, beautiful flowers that just flourish naturally. We know that if we want that diversity, if we want that um, uh, 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 variety, we're gonna have to work at it. We're gonna have to cultivate. So we need to work at things like actually recognizing and addressing some of the really systemic barriers there are to some partnerships. And there are things we need to do that. We need to actually think about creating a system that fits everybody that everybody can be a part of so it really is we and it's not you know that you know people sometimes talk to me about i'm going to a meeting with the ics and i say you are the ics we're all part of the ics we need to create a safe space for meaningful dialogue actually really important conversations you know if everything's a task and finish group and everything's an operational forum then we'll lose the richness that's possible in an ICS and this is my one and only shout out to integrated care partnerships I'm an ICP director and the thing that I the reason I do that job and the reason I'm so passionate about it is that I believe the ICPs are the space where we should be coming together and having proper meaningful dialogue that builds relationships between partners and we need to work at making system working the new normal so increasingly as professionals and, and people who work for us are going to be working through all sorts of integrated mechanisms and, and increasingly I see people on all sorts of things, joint appointments, roles aligned to partnerships, joint anointments or, or secondments or co-location or interprofessional roles. But people are people. These are the people we work with day to day. So for me, my working life includes people from a myriad of organisations. And so, you know, increasingly, it's not that we're part of just one team. Increasingly, all of us are part of many, many teams. So we need to work at belonging. This is my last book reference, which is Owen Eastman's book about belonging. And he talks about, he's the guy who helped the English rugby team. And he talked about the, the Maori way of explaining kind of, you know, your place in the world and, and, and how you belong to any tribe. He talks about family as being something he called whakapapa. He talked about 
building belonging as being about building a story of us. What's our story of us together, togetherness and having a shared purpose? He talks about the importance of mana, bringing respect to your tribe and Rangatira about the, the important work of weaving a group of people together. We've got to weave ourselves together across organisations, across sectors increasingly. And um, I just want to finish with this, which is this is a picture of what for me, Waka Papa, Mama, uh, Mama and Rangatira look like in our ICS. These are pictures of people doing things together, recognising um, achievements from the tribe and, you know, really kind of, you know, starting to kind of build that story of togetherness. So that's what I've got to offer today. And what I'd say finally is if we do all of this, if we do all of this, maybe one day we can do the most important thing, which is finally really impress your mum. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susanna. We've been getting lots of comments in, in the chat asking for all the references and we will be sharing both your recording and the, the um, slides, if we may. So we've only got 10 minutes left, but we would really welcome any questions for Susanna. For speed, it may just be best if you pop your hand up and if Susanna, can you see the, the hands raised if you've stopped sharing yeah. your screen? Would you be all right to curate who you invite to ask you a question then? Just, I think that'll be the quickest way. More than happy, yeah. Cut me out. the <laughs> So, I mean, before before we get into a question, I just wanted to comment that the storytelling aspect of what you just told us, there's so many touch points there where I've thought, yes, yes, that's me, that's me. And even down to the blended family, I uh, having two Isabels sounds mind bending. Um, I, I have my, my very close dear friend uh, is in a blended family and she acquired a second daughter of a very similar age to her own daughter. And I've been watching that for the past 10 years. And uh, certainly, yes, juggling multiple teenage girls in one household. I had fun with just the one and the teenage boys. So, <laughs> yeah, well done. OK, do we have some questions for Susanna? Is there a hand up? I can't see one at the moment. Susanna Somebody's Susanna. commented about TED Talks and... Um, uh, Lucy yep. said, so, but um, uh, I can't, don't know which one that was, but um, uh, I would heavily recommend both Simon Sinek's TED Talk on Start With Why, and also I'd recommend um, the uh, one from a talker one day. But Amanda, Amanda Moore's got her hand up. Sorry, I was lurking in the background with everything turned off. So um, I just wanted, it was more of a comment really in terms of um, really inspiring to hear some of the stories and some of the connections to some of the things that have happened around the world. And uh, I just found that really, really inspiring to hear. I think for me, the the um, uh, some of the solutions, one of the, I think you put up a slide that sort of talked about and what can we do about this? And I was waiting with bated breath for the answer, the, 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 the silver bullet or whatever, in terms of how do we make this work? And Again, it was just it was almost comforting to acknowledge that there isn't there isn't one, and and obviously uh, acknowledging that that most of this is about that resilience, tenacity, keeping going, keeping building those relationships. Um, I think it was just for me, it was nice to hear. Obviously, you've had lots of success, and but also nice to hear that some of those things are there isn't like a uh, an answer that maybe I don't have. It, it's just it's just uh, uh, keeping going and, and really valuing and recognising the importance of those relationships as well. So, yeah, it wasn't really a question, but just more of an observation. No, thank you. I mean, what I'd say is that I, I think we don't value enough and we feel almost embarrassed about putting time and effort into building the relationships. And actually, it's really important. And the other thing I'd say is that some of the things that have worked well in our ICS have been not so much what we did, but what we didn't do. And sometimes resisting the temptation to set up something hierarchical or just embrace the complexity, that kind of thing, and go with it um, feels. I know that Fiona is going to come in, but just I, that was the other thing that really resonated to me. And you'd said if you, if part of the answer is processing and hierarchy, but well, again, I've been in many of those meetings and hands up, probably been part of those meetings, sort of creating those meetings, trying to find a process based or a or a structural based answer to some of these things so that really resonated with me in terms of having been at those meetings and also possibly being yeah. part of the problem and, and that was something to, for me to take away and reflect upon as well sorry yeah. Fiona I didn't mean to interrupt your hand Fiona you've got a lovely comfy chair <laughs> actually it's lovely and it's nice and warm in here I've got the heater on and I've got my blanket <laughs> um it, just an observation really I I'm very 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 lucky in that my job is partnership that my whole role um, but I work at different levels and I tend to find when I'm working in an operational level with front facing staff, the partnerships work better 
um, only because when you're working with front-facing staff, they will do anything and build any network relationships to make their job easier and what they do easier. Whereas when we start going to strategic meetings and the higher the level of people that I deal with, they tend to want to hold control and, yes, I understand you're doing that, but we want to control it all. You know, so it gets harder, they kind of higher up the, the hierarchy you go at times. But yeah. what would you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd, I'd suggest a kind of couple of things. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I kind of went through that a little bit when I talked about really senior leaders and I, I, I couldn't resist that picture of Donald Trump and <laughs> Angela Merkel and so on. But um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the kind of senior leaders thing, it does get more difficult. Um, and I, I think sometimes also because they, they almost feel as if they've got to hold the position of kind of that organization right. if you like you know that's their responsibility to kind of hold the line kind of thing you know that kind of thing and um, i think there's something about them giving permission so that thing from lee scott about you know just do what you need to do give them permission to um is 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 really really important um and and i think the other thing is the bit of advice i gave about the oba thing i can't stress how important that was that the going back to why and having the conversation about why before what you know people are very very concerned with what it is that we're going to do but when you turn the conversation around and we we had uh, some really miserable periods where things weren't working well and we just felt like we got stuck and it was because the agenda we were being given was all about what 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 and when we turned the conversation around and went back to kind of why it it seemed to flow um more naturally as well and my other tip is that um there's a sort of assumption that if it's difficult then we'll have a few people in the room and really lean into kind of that in actual fact i found that sometimes bringing in more diverse leaders particularly colleagues from district and borough councils and volunteering community sector and who've got a wider view changes the atmosphere in the room if i just get a group of very senior nhs leaders and these are very powerful guys some of the, you know these people um in the room they'll fight it out but when you bring in a more diverse they'll soften the conversation and make it kind of easier and bring other perspectives in so sometimes actually we think we should work through a difficult issue with a few people there sometimes actually having a broader group has worked not quite sure how but it has that, that, just to say as well I, I saw you talk a couple of years ago when you were talking about OBA and I banged on and banged on but Essex Clinic Council doing OBA training they've now just got an agreement and they're going to be doing it very soon so that was a good thing thank you real okay can't see any more hands. Oh, no, there is one. There's, uh, oh, Kate. Well, it's me. <laughs> yes, it's me. I was just going to say, I'd like to reflect that I wish I'd had a, I mean, I did have a good connection to LG to some extent, but I didn't quite feel I'd got an alumni network I could reach out to at the beginning of the pandemic before I'd actually been a participant myself in LG, but when I was just a coordinator. And I was redeployed to helping with food distribution during the pandemic and, and sorting out the Boris boxes and things like that and understanding what was going on in supermarkets and, you know, loo roll shortages and such like. And I got contacted by Cadbury's just after Easter. So it was a heat wave by then. It was a few weeks into lockdown asking if I could help redistribute 16 billion surplus Easter eggs. And I really... <laughs> couldn't solve the problem i you know the, the first answer ask was well do you not have any sort of cold storage spaces that are currently not being used because of lockdown i said well i have, have but most of those are being re just deployed in case they need to be for excess bodies you know it was that bad they were looking to use fridges that i had possibly held on one side for putting deaths in and it's just like ah um and also chocolate you know it's, it's not the healthiest food solution and it was a heat wave so my daughter said well just have them delivered to the back garden mum and i was like i'd have a i'd have a swimming pool full of chocolate if i did that not that I've got a swimming pool, I just would have created one. So I did find some solutions. We did find some ways of distributing some of it. But it, I also only had 24 hours. They just literally said, now or never, what do you want to do? And it was such a massive systemic problem that I couldn't have ever possibly envisaged being asked to solve. Um, and I did use the relationships I had at the time. But I wish I'd had a network like this then to just throw it out there and see what creative solutions had come up and see how the relationships were. Fortunately, there were no heat moments your, your mention of heat and light it was all light actually um yeah. there, there was heat internally i found during response to the pandemic but on the whole all the partnership relationships were about reaching out and light and finding solutions together and i kept coming across lge alumni in those ta you know, tactical coordination groups and so on responding which was amazing so 
I'd like to thank you ever so much again, Susanna. As mentioned in the chat and at the outset of this session, uh, we will be we have been recording. We will be sharing the recording. We'll be sharing Susanna's kind slides and all of her fabulous references and books. I think we've got a whole you know PhD to go into just on the references Susanna's given us. Um, we are always interested in feedback about these sessions because they're new. So if you want to comment on the timing, the content, please let me know privately or publicly. Um, we're probably looking to send uh, invites out for the February one in the very near future as a breakfast one, but I am still wrestling with exactly who our speaker is and what time slot suits them best. But again, if you've got suggestions for speakers, let me know. And don't forget that there's another 10 days available to get applications in for LGE 2024 for any colleagues you may have who are interested in taking part who haven't yet participated. So thank you ever so much. And I hope some of you have managed to enjoy this while enjoying your lunch. I'm conscious people do have to run off to other meetings. So maybe that's sometimes why a Twilight one works. But we do encourage that you can listen to this almost like a podcast um, as a recording on your phone later in the future. Um, and Yes, watch this space for the next one. So th thank you again, Susanna. And bye-bye, everybody. Bye.